Hey everybody, it's Mike Epstein. Welcome to another episode of Speaking of the Arts. This is a really fun conversation I'm excited to share with you guys. I got to speak to Chris Mees. Chris is the founder and owner of Be Natural Agency. Um, I've known Chris for a long time. He's a really great guy. And it was a lot of fun to talk to him because we found out we have a lot in common in our journeys. We both started out as musicians. Um, We both worked for other respectable people in the industry. We have great mentors. And um, I always love finding other entrepreneurs in the music industry. Chris is no exception. He's a great entrepreneur. He's a great leader. And I think anybody listening to this episode is going to find it particularly useful and exciting if you're interested in learning how one builds a booking agency, um, how one kind of thinks about managing the people in it, working with artists, um, all of that. We got into some of the weeds there and it was a lot of fun. Really appreciate your support and thanks for listening. Uh, Again, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with me and I've really been looking forward to speak to uh, speaking with you. By the way, welcome to Speaking of the Arts, our podcast. (laughs) <laughs> oh, excellent. Thanks for the invite. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I was thinking about our conversation and I I can't remember when the first time is we met, but I have a general sense of when the first few times we would have worked together when you and I were both in completely different, um, you know, parts in our career, times in our career. Um, and I, I think I might have still been at Curland, probably. And you are with Seth Abramson at Rabbit Moon Productions. Wow, that's right. Yeah, I didn't realize we went back that far, but that sounds I right. I think so, you know? Um, so yeah. I think that's kind of like where our relationship started. And then, and then obviously it's evolved as we've both evolved. But even before that, um, maybe to start, you know, to talk a little bit about how you got into that role in the music industry. Um, I think there's another comparison to be made because are you a bass player, if I'm remembering correctly? I am. Yeah. So I'm an upright bass player. Yeah. I went to Oberlin Conservatory to study bass and moved to New York to perform. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we we both started as performers because I'm a drummer, but I never got as courageous as you did to make the move to New York to be a performer. I, I definitely fantasized about that in college, like a lot of musicians, a lot of jazz musicians do. Yeah. But but for me, by the time I graduated, I was like totally burnt out. And, I, and all I really knew is that I didn't, whatever I was going to do, it wasn't going to be making a living behind the drums. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. But so that's cool. So you moved to New York to play and you were kind of like getting into the scene and, and gigging and stuff. I was. Um so I moved, I moved to New York right after Oberlin and I was, um, 29 years old or 30, just turned 30. Um, and I moved here to, yeah, to play. And I was going out every night and this, you know, this was, I guess what, 14 years ago now. And New York was a different place then. I mean, I went out every night uh, we'd go to Smalls, we'd go to Fat Cat. Um, I'm trying to think there were other places, St. Nick's Pub, mm-hmm. you know, all of these clubs that were open until like two or four. I think at the time, I think Smalls was open until four. Wow. And I I was out there for maybe three years, you know, almost every night. Good for you almost every night. And, um, and I, you know, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't do it differently. I'm glad that I did it, but I'm also, I couldn't do it again. Yeah. (laughs) I couldn't do it again. It was, it was, it was really, really hard. Sure. Um, but I'm glad I did it because it's, it, it was the, you know, building blocks of where I am now in the music. And I met, the main thing was I was just on the scene and I met all the musicians and I know everyone knew me as a player. So, right. So like moving, transitioning into the business was easy actually, because I didn't have to build trust. I didn't have to do anything like that. It was like, Oh, Chris is working in the business. I'm in because 
there's that, you know, trust, musician to musician trust. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you yeah. get this question a lot? Do you still play? So <laughs> I played this morning. Um, I do, but it, only for myself. Yeah. Uh, um, and, and it's not disciplined at all. It's <laughs> very undisciplined. I, I, I was incredibly disciplined for 10 years. Uh, I practiced, I was one of those eight hours a day practicers. Yeah. I mean, I, I went really deep into the study of the craft and I studied classical and jazz. I had many teachers. I was fully in, 100% in from the moment I woke up until I passed out at night was like jazz bass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or or just music, you know. Um, right. So I I did that. Now it's it's very, very loose. You I know. think it's really awesome though to have it still, you know, because for me, mm -hmm. and I kind of leaned on this more as an excuse, I think, in retrospect, but as a drummer, the whole issue of space and not wanting to make a lot of noise in a small apartment with other people really was an excuse for a long time, especially when I lived in in Boston. And then finally, uh, when we moved here to Michigan, which has now been almost four years, and have space and I've set, you know, when we first got here, I, the first thing I did was unpack my drums and dusted them off. And it's just been, you know, even if, if it, even if for me, it just means five minutes between work or I just need to go play the drums, right? Or I just need to like clear yeah. my head. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. that often, that more often than not is enough for me. And I'm, you know, I don't, it's kind of like what you were just saying. Like, I don't look back on all the hours in the practice room with regret, like, cause it, it really was, it's part of who I am and got me here. Yeah. Um, but I just think I'm more, it's like, I almost am more appreciative now to be able to play just for myself uh, than ever. And that's just, it's kind of a cool thing. It is, it is. And you shouldn't give it up. Yeah. yeah don't, exactly. don't give it, don't. And, and you study jazz, right? Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think anybody that that actually studied jazz music and spent the time to investigate this music on that level should not give it up right. because it's, it's 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 a lifestyle. It's a yep. way of living. It's okay. not, you know, it's a conversation with people, but also with yourself. And it gives you this platform that is always there for you you right. know um and it's infinite it's completely infinite and it can grow with you or not grow but it is like you know it, it's like a garden you have to water it and but if even if you just water it a little bit and just keep it alive a little bit yeah um i think that's important i personally i have i still have aspirations to play um i'm not doing it now because of the intensity of the business has basically taken over my life Mm -hmm. Um, but I still, I, my, one of my kind of core goals is to build the business to a place where I can actually pull back a little bit and, um, and bring back the music in my life. Um, and I want to have, I want to have that. And if that even means just like, I have some friends come over and play some tunes, that's it. And and I'm totally okay with that. I have no, I don't have anything to prove to anybody. Yeah. And um, and maybe you know every once in a while I have a local gig at the you know place down the street. Right. You know? Right. And that's like, that's also community. Yeah. And I that is one thing I will say I miss tremendously from actually playing is just the community of it. Yeah. It's an opportunity to go out be with people when they have to put down their phone. Right. They can't be on the screen. Right. And you yeah. have to be present. You have to be present. And it's like, I miss, I think I miss that probably more than anything. Uh, I know exactly what you're saying. I, so when I was in college, my parents lived in Chicago. And so coming back on college breaks, not knowing anybody, all I would do was try to go um, into the city where there were jam sessions. And that awesome sense of community at those sessions was there. And yeah. I'm still in touch with some of the people. That, and this is this is 20 years ago now. <laughs> um, but I'm still in touch with some of those people. And, and I have just the best memories of that communal feeling of 
you know, everybody of different backgrounds, everybody there for the same reason, just to play yeah. and just to make some music together. It's, yeah. it's, I'm so grateful that I had that experience for sure. So how did you, was there, was working with Seth the first sort of entry or was there something before that? Oh, that's a, that's a cool question. I appreciate it. Um, so there was somebody before that and is it's uh, her name was Pat or her name is Pat Phillips. She's a concert um, producer in New York. She's, I would say, um, in her 80s now. And to, to make a long story short, I met her in, probably three years after getting to New York. I met her through a friend. It was a very random meeting. And um, she was the first person that I had ever met that was in the that was in the business of of music, and she and her partner at the time, Etere Strada, had uh, they were producing concerts in the '80s and '90s, and she still produces them now. In the in I would say the '80s, she was doing, for example, um, Oscar Peterson's. I, I can't remember what birthday, but like Oscar Peterson's birthday celebration at Carnegie Hall. Stuff like and that. She would produce that concert and invite all these artists. And Etere was a classical classical conductor um, and worked for, I think he was the head of, don't quote me on this, but I think it might have been Columbia Records, like the classical division. I'm not exactly sure, but he was he was in the record business yeah. and was a and was a conductor. So, anyways, between the two of them, um that they were very uh, connected in this kind of space where Etere was an actual artist, but they also had a business. Right. And, and, and I, and I started, I was her kind of assistant for a couple of years, but honestly, it was like one or two days a week. I would go over there and help organize some of her emails. It was it was not any kind of official position at all. Right. I was actually gigging full time at that point, but through Pat, um, it was really Pat actually that that pushed me into the business in a way. Um, and she 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 saw me grinding it out on the street, playing and really struggling to make a living, and she was like, "Chris, you." you have something really special here because you actually understand the music and you commute, you know, all the artists, but you also have a business sense. And I never really knew that, frankly, mm -hmm. I didn't know I had a business sense. I never, I didn't go to school for business. I went to school for music and I grew up in Wyoming. I didn't even have a cell phone until I was in my early twenties. You know, I, I just never was a business person, but I had, I have a strong worth ethic, worth, worth work. Ethic. Yeah. And um, so she kind of pointed out that, Hey, you have, you have this, you know, ability to do business and work with artists. You should seriously consider getting a job in the business. I had no idea what that even meant, honestly. And she's like, I'm going to call Seth and just, tell them about you. And it just so happened that I, this was a, a very, I think, kind of pivotal moment in my career. Seth literally had just, I think, I think his executive assistant at the time had just left or was going to leave. And he was actually looking for somebody to take that job at Jazz Standard. And anyway, so Pat hooked up an interview with Seth and I did that. And he offered me this job full time being an, the executive assistant at Jazz Standard. And I had never done anything like that. I, I frankly, I didn't, I'd never run contracts. I had never done um, advancing of shows. I was completely green. Um, but yeah, he offered me the job and, and it was a really, really hard decision for me to make. It was so actually that meant, that meant going full time to work yeah. with. Yeah. Yeah. It was a first, it was a, my, at this time I was 30, 
what was I? I was probably 34. Yeah, I was probably 34 years old, somewhere around there. And I had been completely dedicated to a performance career. Yeah. And that decision to go work in an office nine to five was like a death. Like it was really this, it it was it it was the duality of it was really challenging because on one on one side of it, I was really inspired to like have this opportunity to learn about the business side of the music. And actually it was a I could relax a bit and not have to worry about making a living because I was like actually gonna make a salary. Um whereas up until that point, I was literally hustling gigs to pay rent. Right. So um, it was like, I was excited about having the stability of it. I was excited about working with the artists and learning and all of this stuff. But on the other side, I was like, in a way, giving up my dream. Yeah. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. And it was, it was, it, it was an interesting time. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of jumping ahead in my mind, but I'm just realizing another, you know, we had such similar paths because um, the irony of what you and I both did was to start out or at least I mean you were much further along than I was as a pro professional musician but you know the intent was to start to do that which means um you know there's no security in that right right and then being torn and deciding ultimately to make that decision because you do want to have a job and you're getting really tired from the hustle and the grind of being a performer Fast forward to, and we'll talk about this more whenever you made that transition, fast forward to starting your own company, which means you, we, and we both did this, going back to a place of no yeah. security. <laughs> exactly. Right? And 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 um, having to go the entrepreneurial route. So I'm just, yeah. you know, I, it's so funny how there's something, um, I don't know what the right word is, you know, I guess to, to, not to sound cheesy, but there's kind of a calling there. You you know, you had your calling in some form. It was going to be with this music. Yeah. And I think if I'm being honest with myself, I did too. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's just interesting for me to kind of think about myself as a, in college um, and then making that transition to deciding I want to have a full-time job because I don't want to deal with the insecurity of not having, you know what I mean? But then only to work for myself to not have the security. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, as a musician, musicians are entrepreneurs. Right. And I, if I really look back my whole life, aside from when I was, when I was young and the many years that I worked in restaurants from, from, starting as like a dishwasher and moving up through all the positions to become a server. Um, aside from those gigs, I've always been an entrepreneur um, yeah. as a musician specifically. Um, so the transition actually um, from having some sort of, I guess, a stable paycheck to, to starting a business wasn't scary for me because I'd always, I had been in an, in a frankly vulnerable and insecure place almost my whole life. Sure. Okay. So it was, it wasn't, you know, you were used I, to the risk. I was used to the risk. I live, I live in the risk. Yeah. yeah. And, and I realized that, um, yeah. And that I just, I can do it. I've I've done it before and and this and this actually in many ways is a much safer bet than what I've done in the past. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. I, I know what you mean. Are you still in touch with Pat? Are you guys still in touch? I with am. Him? I am. Yeah. She's um we, we I should stay in better touch with her, but yes, we're we're in touch on a on a fairly regular basis. And she's still out um doing her thing and producing concerts and why, yeah. why do you think she recommended you to Seth specifically? I think is because it's really maybe the only person that she knew that potentially had a job from Okay, me. I see. Yeah, I mean, not and, and I say that not to say that she didn't know people. She knew many people, but I think he was the one that she saw as like, hmm, he, he might have a job for Chris. Yeah. You know, and her goal 
at that time as kind of a mentor to me was to to help me out and to and to guide me and i should i feel like that's an important part that i should mention in this conversation that i've always sought after um having strong mentors yeah i'm super i'm only here because of having good direction and well and a good and a strong work ethic but but at the end of the day i've had really good people behind me that have like opened doors and supported me and helped you know push me along this path yeah that's i, I would love to talk to you more about that that was one of the questions i had for you to hear from you if you have had any mentors along the way so 100 and i still and i still have them and and even you know I call on them all the time. And one, I would say almost weekly, I'm making a call to one of my mentors, um, and I have many, um, to just ask for advice. Yeah. How do I handle this? Um, what, you know, what do you think about this? Or, or maybe just to talk because the pressures of the business and the pressures of this sort of mammoth that we hold becomes sometimes it's a lot to deal with. And I just need the perspective of an older person that has been through some form of this to just support me. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. And it's also important to acknowledge that you are, a lot of people are afraid to ask for help. And, and I think, especially in the entrepreneurial world, there's this idea of the rugged individual and and you have to shoulder it all by yourself. And the more I learn about, you know, business and entrepreneurial um, processes and, and the mindset, really, it's very obvious to me that the most successful people are the ones who have no problem asking for help, right? Not, you know, because there's a, such a big difference between, like you were just saying, having that support and, um just what am I trying to say? Not, you know, giving what you're getting, mm -hmm. but I, yeah, the mentor thing is huge. So did, would, would you consider Seth a mentor? Are you guys still in touch? Yeah. Yeah, he is. And then, um, and then from Seth, I'll just kind of continue on the path, uh, real quick. I was with Seth for about two years and I realized that I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be, um, how do I put this? I guess in a traditional office setting, I didn't want to be sitting in an office nine to five. I needed a, a little more freedom in my life. So I actually decided to leave there. And that's, that was another, and maybe the biggest step that I've made in my professional life was, was leaving there and deciding, okay, what am I doing? Am I going to go back to performing? Am I going to, um, what, what am I going to do? And I, and I decided that I was going to start managing artists and I, I kind of made this decision on a whim. I, really, I wasn't really thinking about it all that much. I just thought, man, yeah, this is, I could do it. I've, I've never been a manager, but I, I've been working with managers now and I, I, I see what it is. Um, so I actually went to the Village Vanguard um, probably a, a week or two after I'd left Jazz Standard. And I went to the Vanguard to see Gerald Clayton. And I've known Gerald for years um, since he was 18 playing in, in California. And I just mentioned it to him. I said, hey, you know, do you, do you have management? And what, you know, what does that look like for you? I'm considering going in going into management and essentially he was like well let's talk about it and we we met I think a week later and we decided to to do it and I started managing Gerald um and and then through there I started taking meetings with kind of folks that I'd met through Jazz Standard like other professionals in the business mm -hmm. and one of them was Joel Chris who had Chris and Company uh -huh. for many years and I think I have to say that that was probably the best meeting Joel 
was the best thing that has ever happened to me professionally. And it was a completely uh, casual meeting. He, I met him at, I think it was at, I want to say it was at a bar called Knickerbockers in the West Village. And I just, you know, I came in, I had no expectations. I just knew that I, that Joel was an agent. And at the time I didn't fully understand what an agent was, I guess, um, or what that job actually was. But um, I had been in touch with them a little bit at Jazz Standard and Seth used to work for Joel. So there was, yeah, so so there was that connection. So did Jamie Ziefert. I knew that, yeah. Yeah, Jamie worked with Joel and and Eric Adeo and several other folks that I had been working with all kind of came through Joel's office. So <clears throat> Joel and I met and it was just a fantastic meeting of of the of like two like-minded people that really communicated well and and he basically he basically told me he's like I've seen you around the scene I can tell that you know the music you come to all the gigs um at that time I was going to I mean I was probably seeing I don't know four to seven shows a week yeah. I was going, I was seeing music all the time, sometimes multiple shows a night. Um, and I would see him there all the time. And we'd kind of talk about music. And I was like, very interested about him because he had this agent vibe, but he was very much about the music. Mm -hmm. And come to the gig and he would sit in the front row and would be bobbing his head and would be fully into the music. So that really resonated with me. Anyways, he basically told me, he's, he said, you know, I have this, I have my agency, it's running on fumes. I'm, I'm basically retired, but I'm still doing certain, you know, I'm still doing stuff in the business. I'm not looking to, you know, be a full-time agent again, but I have this agency and contacts and things are happening. And you, if you're interested, you can use it as a toolbox. Oh, nice. Yeah. And essentially we create, and, and, oh, he also mentioned, I should say, he said, you know, if you're looking to make a living in the business, like you're going to have a really hard time doing that with one client. Right. Um, and he's like, it's great that you're working with Gerald. Gerald's a great first client. I mean, that's, it's excellent. But he he's like, you're, you, if you are going to actually make a living doing this, you need to build a way bigger web and you need contacts that aren't just in New York, but they're global. And this was the first time that I even thought about jazz in this sort of global space. I, I had been so New York or US, not even US centric. I was like New York centric and I didn't really think about jazz outside of New York. And so he kind of opened that that door for me and we ended up creating a joint venture agreement where I, I started my own business, which is Be Natural Management Incorporated. And then he had Jake Chris and company. And we created a joint venture where we, um, yeah, we had a share of profits and we had a whole structure. And that was really how it started. And I would go into his office, which was um, in the West Village I started going in twice a week, something like that. And I just, I learned how, how the whole thing was working and I just got really inspired and I just started working. And then Joel started seeing me as like, damn, this kid, this kid wants this. Yeah. And, and it just went from there. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So um, I'm going to go back just a second. Why? When so you when you were working with Seth, mm -hmm. right? You were obviously interfacing with a lot of agents and managers and artists directly. Why was the initial move for you into management? Yeah, good question. Um, as I said, it it wasn't a well thought out. It wasn't a well thought out decision. It would it would just seemed like something that I could do that was available. Yeah. There were I, I saw, you know, I think I think what it was, I saw a need. I saw a need. And I've always felt that, and this is an important distinction, 
there aren't jobs in this industry. You have to create a position for yourself. Yeah, that's true. And that's what I've done. And that's what my company is. Mm -hmm. I, there wasn't a job for me. I had to make the job. Right. And that's what I've done. And yeah. that's, and, and I didn't even realize it as I was doing it. But now, as I look back, connecting the dots backwards, I can see that's what, it, that's what I was doing. And I was, it, it's a, it's a response to being a bassist and waiting for the phone to ring and waiting for validation from others to employ me and to move me forward. I got tired of that. Yeah. I didn't, I'm tired of waiting for someone else's validation to make my own life happen. Right. So I just took control of that. And I just said, you know what? I, these people out here that I'm waiting to get validation from, actually, many of them know less than I do. Yeah. I st and that realization came to me and I just started standing up and making my own decisions and deciding that I was going to take my career into my own hands. Yeah. I mean, we've had, it's amazing how similar paths we've had. I mean, just different players, but very <laughs> similar. Mm -hmm. And yeah, one of the things you said earlier, I wanted to touch on when you were working with Seth and decided you could just, you just knew after a few years, long-term, it wasn't quite the right fit. You said you wanted more freedom. And mm -hmm. one of my mentors talks about every entrepreneur is essentially working to create or to increase the amount of freedom that they have in four different areas. He calls it the four freedoms, mm -hmm. freedom of time, freedom of purpose, freedom of money, and freedom of relationships. So, you know, you're trying, you're constantly trying to increase the amount of free time you have, right? Increase the amount of money, make your purpose bigger, increase that. And then for relationships, get to a point where you're focusing on your biggest and best relationships and increasing those, the four freedoms. I like that a lot. Who, and, who, who said that? So my top mentor is a guy named Dan Sullivan. Mm-hmm. And this is the founder of a program I think I've mentioned to you called the Strategic Coach Program. You did. Yeah. So you that's a program for all entrepreneurs, right? It has nothing to do with industry. And I've really, it's transformed my life personally and professionally. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it's fun to connect with any entrepreneur on that freedom level because, you know, once, once you taste it, it's yeah. like, it's worth the fight. Like it's worth the fight to increase the amount of freedom you have in those different aspects of your life. And, you know, that's, that's the, that's to me, right. That whole idea of, um, you know, yes, you're working for yourself. There isn't, there isn't security like there is in a traditional job, but you're going from a, um, you're going from a security place, a security based mindset to an opportunity based mindset. Mm -hmm. you know, I have another mentor who likes to say every he's an entrepreneur too. Every morning he wakes up, he says, he tells himself, I'm unemployed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Like yeah. who's going to be lucky enough to talk to me today? <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. I, uh, like that. I like that. Yeah. So, but anyway, I'm, I'm just really enjoying learning more about your background because, you know, we've known each other for a while, but I haven't, we've never really had a chance to go deep like this. So this is, this is really cool. Yeah. So, I like it. I like it too. Yeah. How long then was the <clears throat> joint venture with Chris before it became your own entity? Right. So let's see. I started being natural in 2014. Um, and Joel, Joel and I were working together for about... I want to say three years, something like that. And actually it was going, it was going really well and could have kept going, but Joel had a health crisis. Um, and yeah, yeah, he had a, he had a, a serious health, um, scare. And basically when that happened, it, how do I put this? I want, I wanted to, um, 
continue to support our working relationship. But I also felt that it was my, it was just my time. I, I just needed, I just needed to have my own business and run it how I wanted to run it. I, I don't, I don't know how else to put that. I just, you don't have to I, put it any other way. That's yeah. I didn't want, want to be attached. Yeah, yeah. I wanted complete freedom in my work. I didn't, I didn't want to be attached to anyone else. I trusted myself. Um, and I was, I, and I was willing to make that jump. Um, because again, you have to, re you have to remember that jump was not a big jump because I, it's not like I was making a bunch of money. I wasn't making a bunch of money anyways. Yeah. Totally. I was make I was just barely making it by and and frankly it would I've just been making it by for many many years it's really only been in the last few years where the business started making some actual business sense mm -hmm. yes. but the first many years I mean if I showed you the books people would look at me like I'm nuts like I'm completely <laughs> insane and they're not wrong <laughs> They're not wrong because I was also, mind you, I was also working nonstop. I mean, I was working constantly right. for for those years and not making money. I mean, very little money. But I thankfully, and I'm and I'm it just so happened that my li I didn't have a kid, I didn't have kids. Um I was single um well, I was dating, but I wasn't married during that period. Um, I, I was in a very affordable living situation. Yeah. So, and that's actually something that I tell, I, I have a lot of, um, students come to me mostly through Oberlin because mm -hmm. I'm an Oberlin alum, but, um, that come to be, uh, that, that want to learn about the business or, um, even come work with me and I always tell them or or actually move to New York to perform or whatever yeah. and I always tell them you know if you are really going to pursue a life in the arts it's very important that you have a your, your living situation needs to be you know manageable right. if you move to New York and your rent is three grand you're not <laughs> you're you're going to end up working at Google. <laughs> like I, I mean, there's just no way. You have to find a way to live cheaply, you know, unless unless you come from unless you have money coming from another source, then that's another story. But I didn't, and I had to actually make my rent. And the reason why I have my business and was able to put 10 years into this before I made any real money was because I had very, I, I had a very manageable bottom line. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. I want to ask you some specific questions about your experience, you know, with your business, as a, especially as an agent, because I'm always trying to, like you, I'm always trying to become a better agent. And so, um, yeah, I mean, you know, what are a couple of, couple of questions I wanted to hit on? Um, what have you found to be effective when working with artists who have ineffective managers? And I, when you, before I knew you had any experience as a manager, you know, I, I didn't really realize that before I was going to ask you that question. But now that I know you, you have that experience and that's also, I mean, again, so many similarities between the two of us, before I got into the booking side of the business, I was in management. I was, um, Pat, hmm. I was Pat Matheny's assistant's manager. Oh, got it. I didn't realize that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So um for for you know decades and decades, um, David Sholmson was Pat Matheny's manager. And right. I was at the Kirkland agency. I ended up becoming David's assistant. And at I... the time, they were all he was also managing um Brian Blade. So for me as a drummer, you know, that was like I couldn't imagine doing anything, but I didn't care if it meant mailing him a physical letter or <laughs> Yeah, it, it really, it truly didn't matter to me as long as it was in service of um, working with Brian Blade. So anyway, my point is, I feel fortunate because I really got to see for years 
uh, in the you know day in day out what really went into some what I would consider and a lot of people would consider world class management for a world class artist. So mm -hmm. to have that perspective has helped me a lot once I transitioned into uh, the agent role and interface with a lot of artist managers. Um, you know, that's probably a whole podcast episode we could do right there on yeah. the dynamics yeah. of agents and managers and artists. But yeah, I mean, just in your experience, you know, how do you kind of navigate that dynamic when there's a disconnect? Because it feels like that often comes up. Um, and to be fair, I'm sure managers would say that there's a lot of bad agents out there. I mean, I get it. It's, you Absolutely. know, it's, it's not one sided. But what's your experience been like with that? Yeah, it's it's certainly a two way street. Um, I wish I, I, I would like to actually flip that question on you because I think you, it sounds like you have even a deeper experience in, in seeing what good management looks like. Um, and we can get to that, but I guess for me, um, it, that's such a, that's such a layered question. Yeah, <laughs> um, and I and I'm being I want to be PC about it too, um, <laughs> but you're right. I I am finding that that management is is a, a lot of times the it's just such a crucial role, and I I do find that a lot of managers get in the way of the process, um. And I, at least in my experience, it's a lot of almost fear base or this mentality that people are trying to take advantage that get that often puts a wrench in the whole, the whole situation. It's, it's, it's still a mystery to me when I, when as an, as the agent, I'm bringing forth the best opportunities that I can find for this artist. And it's met with some negative response. Right. Right. And as if the agent is trying to take advantage of this artist. Right. And now mind you, may that maybe that happens in the pop world where there's like millions of dollars on the table and it's a totally different animal. I work in the jazz world and for the most part, the presenters, and I can definitely speak for myself, are only trying to do the best by the artist. Right. And it gets, it gets a bit frustrating from time, you know, it gets frustrating at times where I'm like, why am I the bad guy here? Right. I'm out in these streets, digging ditches to make this stuff happen. And it's met with, you know, this this sort of like negative response. And and I think I, I wish that managers could see us as a team. You know, we're a team. We work together. If I'm a good agent and you're a good manager, this we can we can do this dance. Yeah. And it can be, I, I'm not saying it's not going to have any any challenges it, it absolutely will any any business or human relationship is going to have those things but but let's just get our communication solid and i think the communication piece is the biggest part it's like why am i sending offers and not getting and and not getting a response you know this yeah. is an opportunity here that we're trying to make happen this is what our job is but it's like I'm having to chase for weeks to get an answer on an offer. Right, right. That type of stuff. It just, it start, It takes the wind out of my sails and it makes yeah. me look for other, it's over time, it makes me look for other artists to work with because I, I just right. get tired of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, have you ever read the book CAA Powerhouse? No. So it's the story of CAA as told by the founders and then also fast forwarding to present day people who work there. It came out, I don't know when it came out, call it five years ago, maybe more, Oh, interesting. probably more than five years ago, but within the last decade, mm -hmm. I've read it twice because it, you know, it's, it's directly relates to what you and I do, although it's a much bigger scale, like your comments about if we were working in the pop world, 
and there was much more money involved. I mean, that reminded me of the book. But um, one of the one of the founders was talking about, uh, you know, kind of related to what we're talking about. But basically, he was saying his approach to to bringing an offer to an artist or to a client, and he was saying he would he would always try. And again, we're talking about you know the biggest artists in the world, right? But regardless, he was saying he would always try to frame it to the artist as a miracle has happened. This organization has made an offer for you. Yeah. And not not trying to say nobody else is going to make an offer to you. You've got a lot of problems. It's a miracle. No, like the fact that there's an offer on the table for you to do something creative that you want to do, it's a miracle for a lot yeah. of reasons, you know? And yeah. that really has always stuck with me. And I've always sadly, you know, you're talking about the pushback you get <laughs> or or the lack of response that you get, right? Um, I have to remind myself that unless you've done what we're doing, unless you've, you're in the day in, day out trenches, I don't think people are aware of what goes into it just to get that offer. Yeah, that's but, right. You know, just to get, and again, to your point about you're, we're working in the jazz world, less than 1% of the world's population listens to jazz. Yeah. To me, it's even more miraculous that 100%. anybody is getting offers. A hundred percent. You know, now, obviously we're not advocating that artists should take bad offers and lose money and all that, but, no. but um, yeah, I, I would be remiss if I didn't kind of recount some of the things I learned from that book. It's really good. CAA powerhouse. I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to, I'm going to remember that. I'll, re, I'll read that. That's, yeah. It's, a, it's such a great read because um, it, again, it was, it's told via interviews. So you're reading, you're, you're reading transcripts but it's organized in a timeline fashion, right? So it kind of does read like a more traditional nonfiction book, but it, it's all interviews. Oh, that's a, right. that's incredible. I'm 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 going to read it for sure. The, the author who 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 produced it or wrote it is the same person who wrote um I forgot the title, but it's the same concept, but it's that's the story of Saturday Night Live. Mm -hmm. So he interviewed, you know, probably Lauren Michaels and all the, you know, whoever was involved and and artists and age, you know, the whole deal and um but in that format, it's really cool. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Thanks for that. I'll read it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think one other thing I could add just to the question of, you know, how do you be effective with ineffective managers and all that? Um, uh, when I started, you know, I my, I got my start as an intern at the Curland Agency. Mm -hmm. I thought that was going to last for two months because it's an unpaid thing, you know, and I just, I was at a point in my life um, early on because I was just starting out from college, basically. But um, I decided it was really worth it to me to do that, even if it meant moving back home, because I was just so obsessed all of a sudden with this idea of working with artists and like that whole capacity. And it was all new to me. I didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. But um, so that is probably around the time you kind of got your start in the in the business. I mean, for me, that was maybe it was a little earlier for me. That was the fall of 2007. Oh, definitely earlier. OK, yep. so. But in my mind, there's a there's this, you know, the the way technology has completely upended the industry, I feel like I was kind of at this this it's definitely not the beginning of it, but it's it's this point of this seismic shift happening. And I'm just trying to relate this change in technology and the way business is done to how managers approach their jobs, because all this great technology now, our jobs as agents hasn't changed. There's great tools to help us do our jobs. At the end of the day, as you know, it's just a relationship business and it's about being persistent and organized. Right. But I think for managers, it's been especially difficult if you came from a traditionally from a place of trying to um, secure a, a really solid record deal for your artist, right? Right. And then having that be at the time or or before then, certainly in the, you know, before you and I were even born, the record sold the tour and right. the record made or break the artist. And it was it was literally the record, everything outward. And I remember talking to one of the, excuse me, one of the um, senior agents at the Curlin Agency. And she was telling me that when she got her start and for a long time in her career, they uh, more often than not had to convince artists to tour. Really? Because 
<laughs> there was more money coming in from uh, the record sales and royalties. Uh, and I remember when she told that, I was floored. I, I was like, yeah. you're joking. Yeah. No, that that is, that's shocking. Because that it's is, shocking. So yeah, it doesn't exist anymore. Right. Certainly doesn't exist anymore. But again, thinking about, um, I'll just use your words, you know, you need to create a job for yourself in the in, in this industry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. So this is why I personally, and I've I've really come close over the years at certain points with thinking about managing an artist. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe I still will someday because there are a few artists that I work with that I, I would love to manage if I'm being perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. But that aside, I think this is, that's one of the main reasons why I never really considered that to be a full-time thing for me or to try to make that a full-time thing because it's so much less clear to me <laughs> right that's right a really good artist can easily hire a competent assistant to do travel logistics help them advance dates and everything so it begs the question what could i offer then right and i think at best for you know sort of like an early to call it mid-level career artist um, for me as an agent, it would be, a, it's, a, it's not that complicated. It would be just so helpful to have direction, right? right? Just give me direction. Just tell me, you know, let's work together on the calendar and tell me what do you want this touring strategy to look like? Because otherwise so much gets lost in the um, shuffle and the translation and all that. But a simple question is that is often, I'm never asked that or I'm never, you know, so I well, don't know. A lot of the, the truth is a lot of managers, unfortunately, they don't know. They right. don't have a plan. Right. And that's that there, there lies the problem. Yeah. Totally. There is there isn't a plan. And in fact, I'm finding that we as agents a lot of times are the ones that are actually making the plan. Yes. Absolutely. And and informing the manager what the best plan is right which isn't ideal but it it's you know it tends to be what happens yeah it tends to be and then i also think it's important to to really um i to really identify that there's a difference between a tour manager and a manager yeah yeah, yeah and, there, and mo a lot of man of managers are are just tour managers you know logistic managers and and that's when I decided recently to move out of the management space, it was, it was because of that. And I, I had to be honest with the artists and say, I'm not being a good manager. Because to be a good manager, that's a full-time job unto itself. Yep, absolutely. Um, it's really like, can you be an agent and a manager? Yes. I'm not saying it's impossible. You can. But I'm the type that I want to do the best possible job that I can do in whatever I do. And I realized that once the agency started growing and the booking started in, to increase, that I couldn't do both well. I had to make a decision. Am I going to be a, an agent or am I going to be a manager? Right. And, and for me, I both both have their challenges and you know some days i i don't love being an agent and there were days i didn't love being a manager they both have their frustrations and challenges but for me personally i prefer at least at this moment in my career to be an agent and that's because i enjoy being a connector and i enjoy creating opportunities yeah, like that's the thing that gets me excited. Like the thing that inspires me most is getting a great offer and bringing it to an artist. Everything after that, I'm like, see you after the gig. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or or see you at the gig. You know what I mean? I really don't. I don't enjoy the management of the gig or the management. It's just not. It's just not my strength. You know all the little details about the hotels and the da 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 it's no thank you yeah, um, i really just enjoy the the hunt of of like seeing an artist hearing their music and and knowing where they're coming from and finding the next step uh, and like 
making that actually a reality yeah. is is for me what 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 I want to do. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Do you find that you have trouble saying no to an artist? Yes, but I'm getting better at it. Um, and I'm finding that saying no is one of the most important things that I do in a day. I used to be a yes man. And, and thankfully, the business has gotten to a place where I can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. I can't say yes. I, I, I would be doing a, a disservice. I, there's only so much time in the day. We're a small team. You know, I don't have a, a bunch of people working. We're a small team, and I like it that way. And I really want the team to be working on things that really make sense. And I'm finding that a lot of artists, I can love an artist. And in fact, some of the artists that I love the most, I could take them on or we could take them on and spend years booking them. And it's not going to happen. It's just not. And, and it's a sad reality in, in some ways, but it's the reality. And some of the top, top creators and the just these amazingly brilliant people, they may not ever really have like a, a robust touring career. Right. It's just not, it's not the reality of the world. Right. So I think I, you know, I think I have to, or we have to kind of choose wisely um the folks that we take on and and it it does come down to business and but but one thing that is i will say very important to me is i can't i can't do a good job for anybody if i'm not genuinely inspired by their work right i exactly. just can't it's not in my dna it's not i i mean you know if 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 it was something where the money was really compelling, then maybe I could, because the money could take that space and like, I would get ex excited about making the money. But, but in general, I really love handling and working with special artists that I'm, that I listen to that I think are really doing good work and need to be heard, but not just need to be heard. There's a space, I can see a, a space for them. And I can, in in our network, in the, in the buyers that we know and the festivals and the PACs and the, all these people, I can see like, okay, I think we have a shot with this artist. I, I can't guarantee it. And I've definitely been wrong, but they're, they are doing something that I can see in this space. And I'm inspired enough to take that on, to take that on. And, and it might be, as you know, sometimes I've had artists on the roster for two, three years before we can get anything popping. Right. And that's just the reality. And that's, that's like this managing of expectations. That's like, and I said this, I say this all the time. We're agents. We don't create demand. We, we help facilitate demand. But yep. the demand has to come from the art. You yep. have to be saying something. You have to be speaking to people. It has to come from the artist. There's only so much we can do. Now, can we plug them into a gig here and there because some folks need to fill a slot? Sure. But if you're really trying to build a career as a, an artist, like you have to be saying something. Yeah. 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 And I think that also goes back to your background um, as an artist yourself and being immersed in it as you were and playing, right? And knowing the difference between when a presentation on stage is resonating and speaking to the audience and when it's not. When it's not, that's right. And being able to really recognize that, that importance. I mean, I'm totally with you. I can't yeah, I can only, I'm only effective if I am truly inspired by it. And if I can, you know, no question, easily see the connection that, that is going to be made between the artist and an audience. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's too hard. It's really just too hard. It is. 
I'm also, I'm also seeing that an artist really needs a team, you know, that we need help. I can't just take on an artist and just make gigs, you know, appear. Right. Um, well, I mean, we, we can do that on a, on a small level, you know, we can, it is possible to put some gigs together for an artist that say doesn't have a label and doesn't have management and doesn't have a PR plan. And it's possible, but I mean, I'm, it's becoming harder and harder to do that. I, I think I'm really looking for an artist that one is, is creating great music or actually to me, it's not even just about the music. It's their, it's their story. They're, they're telling the story. Yeah. And if that story is compelling enough to me to interest me, um, I tend to say, okay, if I, I think if I'm really interested in this, then there must be something interesting there that's going to pull in an audience. And, but I, but it then quickly goes into, do they have a manager? Is there, is there a label? Are they putting out a record? You know, it's just, those things that kind of help us build this bigger, you know, this bigger awareness around an artist. Right. Definitely. Yeah. Um, man, there's a lot more we could talk about, but I want to be conscious of our time and maybe, maybe we could do another um, conversation in the future because sure. we could just go deep in some of these topics we haven't even really touched on. Sure. But and we could even do it, you know, just you and I, we don't, we yeah, yeah. I'm happy to do it on the podcast, but I'm also, I'm also just happy to have these conversations because it's, it's, I enjoy them. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Awesome. Me too. Um, well, cool. Maybe my last question would be, cause I'm curious, what are a few books you've read lately, you know, regardless of whether they're business books or maybe it's fiction, it doesn't really matter. I'm always looking for a good read. Is there anything you yeah. might check out? Yeah, sure. Um, the most recent book was called, um, setting the table by danny myers okay he's uh owner of shake shack oh yeah okay and and um union what is it union hospitality group so he's a he's a restaurateur yeah and and just a brilliant a brilliant mind and a, and a brilliant um entrepreneur and he's created this huge yeah. company <laughs> um yeah. But I think it's a great it's a great read. I it also ties into the restaurant industry, which is something that's been very critical and important in my professional life. Hmm. Many of the things that I've learned in in life and in business was in a restaurant. You have just you have to deal with people. You have to deal with stress. You have, you have to, to deliver too. That's the you thing. have to deliver. You, I mean, it's it's all of it. Yeah. It's all of it. And so I've always been very into a well-run restaurant and like what goes into making that happen. So, and then also Danny Meyer um, owned Jazz Standard. That's how, that's actually right. how I became aware of him as he, he owned Blue Smoke Jazz Standard. And I sort of started following his work. And that was, I think that was actually before Shake Shack or maybe at the very beginning of Shake Shack. But anyways, the book is the book is great. Um, a couple, just to give a couple points from the book that I think really stood out. Um, he said he talks about um, being an entrepreneur and how being a good business person. And he says um, business is all about hospitality and the way you make people feel. The experience yeah and that and that is something that i really think about in every interaction that i have in every email in every single phone call it's it's not just that we're doing making this transaction it's it's how are we making like what is going to make this person want to continue working with me yeah and it's generally how do i make them feel after that call, you know, or after that, how do our emails feel? 
and it's and it's a real nuanced type of thing but it's also a human thing and it's also taking out this isn't just i don't want to live my life in a transactional way right and i want to these are people that matter and these are people with families and i have a family and these are you know this is a business that i is meaningful to me these are artists that are meaningful to me i and also i just want to come to work and feel good you know i don't want to come to work and be in fights with people and uh, it's just not my style you know i i so that that anyways to tie it back into the book that that's a big piece that i walked away from that book with nice i'll have to check it out setting the table setting the table yeah yeah cool 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 well this has been great man i love speaking to you i really enjoy um yeah our time together i've learned a lot from talking to you and Likewise. i just want to thank you again for um taking the time to talk to me this is great yeah, my my pleasure. Thanks for asking. And um, the door is always open. Thanks so much, Chris. Okay. Thanks.